Welcome to NeuroNoodle's Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast, featuring tech legend Jake Gunkelman. He's the man who has read well over half a million brain scans, and Dr. Marie Swingle, author of iMinds. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. The NeuroNoodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you. Lyme disease, that's a new one. Oh, well, you know, He's you're... logging in. Dr. Marie's popping in. Okay. Good, good, good. And, Jason, how we'll... did Dr. Marie. Hello, hello. Hi, good morning. Good morning. And Marie is there. Right there. She is. There I am. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Mindy Hockendahl. Mit- no Mit- N, no N. Hockadol, 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 Hockadol. And it starts again. <laughs> <laughs> I said it right. I'm from Chicago. You Minnesota people talk differently. We do. Maybe we, we do. just let you in on the jokes rather quickly. We we, we constantly tease Pete uh, for his delicious m- and consistent mispronunciation of names. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. a dialect, and I think you you know. I, I think there's going to be a group that's going to protest you, Dr. Marie. <laughs> Dr. Who? <laughs> Dr. Who? <laughs> it's Mari, Mindy, by the way. Mari. Okay. You know, I have your book sitting right here next to me, also. Okay. Um, uh-huh. The Eye Minds. Yeah. Uh, I hear that's a pretty good book. It is a good book. It's very thick, but it's very right. good. Yeah. <laughs> Anything you want to delve into, it's in there, yeah. Yes, yes. So, so Mindy, how did you find us and how did we get you on this podcast? I'm sure it was a pretty thorough process uh, to get on here. How did that go? Yeah, you know, I'm actually part of a little um, cohort with a few other neurotherapists throughout the world. And one day, a woman from Venezuela brought up your podcast. And so I started listening and then, you know, right when I logged on, it says, do you want to be a guest? And I'm like, well, why not? Sure. Let's do it. Let's have a conversation. So um, that's kind of how I found you. Yeah. And it was an email, huh? Yeah. Yep. And the response time was pretty good. And all of a sudden you're here. Here. Days later, it was (laughs) pretty quick turnaround. It was wonderful. And And Venezuela, you you obviously have like a, uh, a client or uh, one of the networks down there or uh, well I'm so I work with um, Dr. Nathan Brown and I'm in like a little cohort that we meet every week and just talk about neurofeedback and some research and there's um, a woman from Venezuela there's a guy from Canada there's a man from Hawaii so we're kind of all over the place just talking about what we do and brainstorming and researching and kind of just talk together right excellent approach to kind of have a collaborative group that ends up being able to support each other so right right yeah it's wonderful yeah yeah i like the international um uh, groups as well you just you know when you're when you're too close to your own community etc you you miss out on so much whether it's research or practice so that's great right Right. Join right. groups, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Jay, Min, uh, Jay and uh, Dr. Marie, uh, Minnie brought up she got a neurofeedback because of Lyme disease. Could you go into that? Because that's a great keyword that uh, and topic that uh, I don't think we ever talked about on this show. Yeah, for sure. Um, so when COVID happened in March 2020, um, you know, the world started to shut down and I became very, very tired. And I didn't know what was wrong with me because I'm a huge proponent of getting enough sleep. And my knees started to hurt. It felt like somebody took a baseball bat to my knees. Mm. And I had no idea what was going on. And I have 31 acres of land and I do not go outside. Like I don't, I don't mess with the ticks. I don't, I don't hunt. I don't fish. I don't do any of that stuff. Um, And my doctor thought I had Lyme disease. And I was like, absolutely not. There's no way I I've never had a tick on me. I've never seen a bite on me, a ring, any of that. Um, and sure enough, blood work came back that I had full blown Lyme disease. I had the Borrelia burgdorferi. I had 
um, mycoplasma, because you get all these co-infections with the Lyme disease. So I had Bartonella, Babesia, just a plethora of things going on. Um, and my biggest symptom other than my joints hurting, hurting was brain. My brain could not do what I wanted it to do. It was like, I was in such a fog and I had no motivation and I just couldn't like find the drive to go and do things. Um, and I'm kind of a workaholic. I love to research and I love to work. And when I couldn't do it, I was just so frustrated. Um, and so I learned about neurofeedback. I was just doing some research and reading articles and discovered that um, when I did a QEEG, I discovered that my whole brain, like a brain mapping, was flowing in delta. I, with chronic infection, a lot of times you have so many slow waves going on. Um, and I was able to learn that through neurofeedback, I could kind of like alter my brain waves. I could, I could get some motivation. I could feel better. Um, you wouldn't believe the amount of people that have come into my life that have Lyme disease and they're bedridden and they don't have a purpose and they feel like they just can't get up and do anything. And here I am working two jobs. I have two kids. I'm running here and there and everywhere. And I feel like I can function cognitively. And I fully believe it is because of neurofeedback. Because I still have Lyme disease. I'm going to have it forever. It's chronic, long, long state, late stage. They think it bit through my dark hair. And I probably never saw it. It probably came in on my dog and just bit me. And there we have it. So Mindy, do you, the Delta, do you see that, is that what you worked on to treat it? Or is that the, the signal, the marker that you, that you still have? So I do still have a lot of Delta flowing, especially in my prefrontal cortex and my temporal lobes. Um, but it doesn't feel as debilitating, mm -hmm. you know, and, and during the day, if I, if I do start feeling the fog, I do neurofeedback right away and I am ready to go and I can get so much work done and I just, I feel accomplished. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I'll probably let Jay or, or take over a little bit, but one of the things I have noticed is um, sometimes with these, um, I would say more obsolete or rare or difficult uh, diseases to work with, you never completely lose the marker. So, I mean, as much as we're data driven, data driven, data driven, it's still kind of a, um, yeah, a, a deregulation marker that, that the, the, the issue is still within your brain or body. Jay, yeah. do you want to take the lead on the details on some of this? Uh, add a little bit, um, you know, your, uh, infections end up triggering your body, uh, to have an autoimmune reaction as well. And uh, a lot of the knee stuff may actually be spirochete in the knee kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. However, the inflammatory stuff in the brain is your um, it, it, autoimmune uh, biomarker. Uh, we did quite a bit of testing after a toxic release at one point. And if you had an autoimmune biomarker against your myelin, you ended up with delta and brain fog that was really profound. We had a bank branch manager that could not add a list of numbers. I mean, you know, a, you know, simple addition and uh, absolutely uh, not able to function. So um, my, my uh, 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 my hat's off to you for uh, accomplishing a recovery uh, from a very difficult uh, circumstance. And there are a lot of people that end up suffering m much longer term. Um, uh, the the uh, um, calming down of the brain is, is obviously a very uh, important feature. And the fact that there's a residual, uh, your brain can develop compensatory mechanisms and uh, you, you probably have a, a, a counterbalancing uh, feature that ends up being a compensatory mechanism for the slope. Um, but you, your center works on ADD, it looks like, based on, you know, kind of, and that, that's kind of the bread and butter, I think, of the uh, neurofeedback uh, world historically um, now obviously has expanded way out from that and not everybody who walks in the door with ADD ADHD ends up having 
you know, that with no other concomitant things like Tourette's or uh, unexpected epileptiform content or something. But you're, um, you, you, you do uh, traditional assessments and treatments. Um, uh, explain kind of the process that you've got going. Yeah. So when a client comes in and they want to be assessed for ADHD, um, depending on what their goal is for treatment, if they are a teenager or a child who needs an accommodation plan at school, obviously I'm going, going to be giving a full psychological assessment. Um, they're going to take the TOVA, the test of variables of attention on the computer, the 22 minute test that looks at processing speed, um, processing consistency, hyperactivity, distractibility, concentration, attention. It does so show some um, anxiety as well. So they would complete the TOVA. They would do the DSM-5 self-reporting. I would gather data for, based on the DSM checklist by parents. I would use the Vanderbilt rating scale and Dr. Thomas Brown's ADD questionnaire. So I take all of that data and I would write them a full report that can go to schools if they want an accommodation plan put in place. And part of my recommendations moving forward with treatment after the diagnosis is made is neurofeedback. Um, a lot of the teens and adults that I work with, they aren't huge advocates for wanting to try medication. And so from after the assessment, they will come in and I will do a QEEG, a brain map on them and see what brain waves are running in their, in their brain with their eyes open, with their eyes closed, counting backwards. Um, and pretty much a hundred percent of the time, if they are diagnosed with ADHD, you know, the whole prefrontal cortex is running too much theta or not enough beta. Um, when their eyes are open, they can't seem to cognitively, um, solve problems and be attentive and focused. I see a lot of sleep disturbances, but with the neurofeedback, I've had amazing results, especially with teenagers and kids when they are doing neurofeedback because I do it remotely. So my clients are able to do it every single day or every other day in the comfort of their home. And I just had a 13 year old boy who was very hyperactive, very distracted, um, he made 43 commission errors in the matter of eight minutes pre neurofeedback. When I just assessed him the other day, he had a hundred percent accuracy. He was a fast responder, had high, um, consistency. So everything was like in the green. He made zero omission errors and zero commission errors. So this is all without the use of medication, just him training his brain every single day for 18 minutes. So I noticed on your website um, that you you do a blend. You, you start in office and then you switch to remote. Can you explain a little bit of the balance and the uh, uh, the procedure? I mean, everybody on this panel knows my my little critiques. Um, yep. You know, in terms of you know when you when and how you you pass the duty on to a client for a higher efficiency. Yeah. So they come in for the initial assessment. I want to give them. Um, a psychological interview, and I want to do the assessment with them so that I make sure that they are calm, they are doing it correctly, um, and they would come in a second time to go over all the results, and we would create the treatment plan together, and they would do their first training in office with me, so I'm teaching them how to accurately use the platform. Some people will choose to come in and see me often for their training sessions, but I work in a in a population where people are very, very busy and they just don't have the time to come in every single day or every other day and they want immediate results. So they do all their trainings after the two sessions with me, then they just do them at home. Obviously, if we are working on ADHD, they're training in the mornings um, to get to get their focus improved, to get their attention going. If it's a day training, they're training in bed, take the headset off right when they go to sleep. Um, and I send them a report every week to show them their progress. I'm also changing the thresholds if need be. Um, if they're experiencing any symptoms, they know they can email me, call me, text me. Um, so I'm really available for them and make the changes necessary for them to get the results that they want. And then usually once their symptoms are improving and they're feeling good, 
they'll come back into the office usually maybe every two months or at four months and we'll redo the assessment and see, you know, how is their brain operating now? What speeds is it running in with their eyes open and eyes closed? And can they toggle and shift when needed to focus and complete a math task? Okay. okay so Sorry. yeah, just underlying the, uh, the therapeutic alliance there that you're, you're not backing out with the remote. So thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So you mentioned uh, the parents didn't want to give their kids uh, uh, stimulants. I, you know, I can't imagine why a parent might not want to give them <laughs> stimulants, like the potential negative side effects of Adderall, uh, uh, similar negative effects of methylphenidate. But uh, when you know, less appetite, headaches, nausea, uh, compulsive and obsessive behaviors, even psychosis. And I go back long enough to remember vaguely the 1960s and 70s when they talked about amphetamine psychosis. If you give amphetamines, the person would become psychotic. Well, mm -hmm. we got a gigantic experiment in young kids nowadays, giving them long-term fairly stiff doses of stimulants. And if the kid has a perfectly normal EEG, it's basically relatively safe and that it's likely not to give them a convulsion. However, if their EEG is not stable, if they have an EEG with discharges in it, even if they've never had a seizure, if you give them an amphetamine, they have an excessively large uh, likelihood, unfortunately, of actually having a breakthrough seizure. And you don't want uh, to end up having a, 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 a child starting to have seizures because the more often they happen, the easier it is for them to happen. So you don't want to end up having it start. And I can fully understand why a parent might be quite reluctant uh, to uh, go ahead with uh, the, the uh, traditional amphetamine sort of a approach, but uh, we also have um, a large list of things that you might be given mm -hmm. if, if you have um, uh, ADHD, ADHD. Ritalin's classic, uh, methylphenidate, um, you know, uh, but Vyvanse and Adderall, these are stimulants. Stratera, is a stimulant-like drug, but it's not an agonist. It's a reuptake inhibitor. Provigil, for those who can't stay awake that have a primary disorder of vigilance, that's an orexin agonist. Guanfacine, to take the steam out of the sail, uh, channel blockers cut down on the excitability of the cortex. Clonidine, similar mechanism, channel blockers. A whole bunch of different kinds of anticonvulsants. Antimanics. Um, Oxytocin is a social bonding hormone that's actually used to reduce mu in the EEG. Uh, it, it, it's commonly given, uh, it's more commonly given in autism. However, it is given, uh, it, it, again, this is a list of uh, drugs that are given to people on uh, various occasions. SSRIs and antidepressants and SNRI stimulating form of an antidepressant. Tetracyclic, kind of a sedating anti-anxiety uh, uh, anti medication. And then antipsychotics, which potentiate epileptiform content. So you could get any one of these if you go through, you know, standard medical treatment. And they don't look at the brain necessarily before they prescribe. So they're going to give you one, and if it doesn't work, they're going to end up withdrawing you from that and give you another. And if that doesn't work, they'll try another. Each of these has potential negative side effects, sometimes fairly serious. As, as an example, lamictal. If you start taking lamictal and you get a rash or a fever and you don't stop it, uh, that can suppress your immune system. You can have aplastic anemia and die, you know? So, um, you, you know, the, the, it, it, it isn't without consequence to try one and see if it works and then try another and see if it works. And then when you get down the entire list, maybe a combination of them might work. Uh, there, there's a very nice study out of UCLA uh, combining Ritalin when there's theta and clonidine or guanfacine 
when there's beta. So they're starting to actually get EEG biomarkers for where you use a combination of the medications. But all of these can be supplanted uh, with the use basically of, um, and let me just get back to the stop screen chair here. Um, uh, all of these can be replaced by neurofeedback. Um, uh, all of the deviations that would be a biomarker that would indicate taking one or another of those drugs are, are things that we can change uh, volitionally uh, with training. And hey, um, uh, what, this might be a topic for another show because it's a big one. Um, so Pete, redirect if you want. I don't want to take up I, you know, part of Mindy's show here. Um, but I am seeing um, notable increases. Um, now, it, it's just an association. It's just something I've noticed thus far. I can't say there's, you know, a correlation or whatnot. But psychotic breaks um, in adults with Vyvanse, specifically Vyvanse. Yeah. Um, can you potentially speak to why there there might be an increase in this? Again, it's not with children; it's with a, a young adults. Um, are we prescribing more Vyvanse? Uh, is there something? And one of the things I'm wondering about is marijuana use and Vyvanse. Is there some kind of negative connection there? And any insight you can give to that? I think um, really helpful. Amphetamines potentiate psychosis. And if you have a high dose consistently over time, uh, it, it, it's a possibility. Uh, um, uh, Vyvanse or Adderall, both are amphetamines. And uh, amphetamine uses uh, jack up your arousal level. They ruin your sleep. Now, if you ruin sleep long enough, you're going to be psychotic in and of itself. Yeah. So th there's some interaction with sl poor sleep, but the amphetamines themselves end up having um, neurochemical breakdown products in the dopamine systems. Uh, they push norepinephrine and dopamine. In the EEG, their strongest uh, indication is they speed up alpha, but they're, they're messing with dopamine is where they end up having their damage um, and, and potentiating psychosis. Um, at one point, there was a, a theory of psychosis, the 6-hydroxyl dopamine uh, theory of, of psychosis, where uh, you, you would have uh, dopamine excreted into the synapse, it would break down an oxidation process, and it would come back into the vesicle. It would bond to the vesicle wall and be like a cork. It plugged the vesicle that it was taken back into by adhering to the vessel wall. And if you tr if you plug up enough vesicles, you basically turn off a dopamine uh, connection. And if you turn off a dopamine connection, the receiving end becomes hypersensitive. It's ready to go. And all you need is one little thing to trigger an all or none response. And uh, at that point, you, you end up having you know, aberrant behaviors uh, yeah. uh, triggered in the limbic system and uh, yeah, psychotic behavior ends up being seen. Yeah. Mindy, you got another job, don't you? I do. Yes. So if you see behind me, I'm like in a cinder block closet here during the day. Um, I am the director of counseling at a private K through 12 Christian Academy um, in Woodbury, Minnesota. So I'm here during the day um, and then my private practice, Afton Therapy, I am two nights a week and occasionally on Sunday afternoons. Where I'm going with that is you got into neurofeedback uh, several years ago. You've been a counselor longer. Now you're seeing the, the positive things that can happen in neurofeedback. You're in a private school, which are more open to different things, I would imagine. Do you see how neurofeedback or getting a baseline EEG could be something that could be introduced in the schools in the future. I know you're early into the game, but uh, what do you, what does the future look like for schools and counseling and using neurofeedback and EEG? I think neurofeedback could be life-changing for schools. Um, with dual relationships, unfortunately, I can't do a lot of things with my current students. Um, but so many times kids come in and I can just picture what their EEG would look like. 
they come in and they're frazzled and they're worked up and I can just picture their amygdala on fire. Um, and so I think that through neural feedback, you can enhance so many kids' ability to process information. They can be emotionally regulated at school. They can have better relationships with their peers. They can retain more information learned. I think that it would be huge for schools if they could somehow incorporate or even just advertise neurofeedback to their student population. You know, and and as we were talking about all the different medications and the dangers along with medications, I just think of the developing brain is so fragile. My daughter is in third grade and she struggles a lot with her attention. Um, she daydreams quite often. And I'm doing neurofeedback on her now. And her teacher says it is a remarkable difference in the classroom. She is happy. She is pleasant. She has leadership roles and she's doing so well. But when I look at my little girl, there is no way I would ever put something in her body that could harm her developing brain from becoming what it should be. And so that's why I'm so passionate about neurofeedback because if you just give the brain what it needs and you train the brain and you exercise the brain, the brain can heal and you can retrain it and versus putting junk into your body that you might have hallucinations. You're going to have to, the disrupted sleep. And, you know, I have seen a lot of clients who get on medication who become very emotionally dysregulated. They become very angry. And a lot of it, I think is from the stimulants. Yeah. And, you know, if you're a neuron, you've got two ways to be controlled. You have a ligand gated ion channel, which medications can latch onto and control the neuron. And you've got a voltage gated ion channel that can control the neuron. And neurofeedback simply uses the voltage gated ion channels instead of the pharmacological ligand gated channels. And um, the, the extent of the control of the nervous system that you can do with the proper training is um, it, it's to the point of being uh, it stretches credulity. You know, people that have intractable epilepsy who have been told your next step is for me to make a best guess and cut out a piece of your brain to maybe stop the seizure. You know, well, gee, that's not really a very rosy possibility. I'm kind of attached to the pieces, you know, so... Um, uh, uh, which piece are you going to take? You know, <laughs> what does it do? Uh, so, the, you know, we can take people who are in that circumstance, having hundreds of seizures a day, intractable epilepsy. There's no way they're being controlled or assisted at all in the traditional medical world. And neurofeedback, with sometimes quite a few hundred sessions, they're seizure-free, and the doctors themselves take them off the medication when they're seizure free and their EEGs are clean. They don't want them on those meds, you know, that they're not being paid to give them, you know? So uh, it, it, it's not like Barclay and Ritalin was back in the day, you know, but uh, um, we're, we're basically uh, seeing intractable epilepsy uh, that, that doesn't really have a chance. And, one third of all epileptics are intractable. And you say, oh, well, yeah, but that's epilepsy. And uh, I, I deal with ADD, so it's not really something I commonly see. Uh, but 25, 30% of the ADD population have unexpected epileptiform discharges. And if you don't know they're there, you may give them that stimulant that will make them have their first ever breakthrough seizure. And if you don't look at the EG, you don't know that it's there. And unfortunately, in psychiatry, it's not common for the psychiatrist to do EGs. It, you know, there's some that do, but they're rare. Uh, mo most of the time, it, they'll they'll listen to your story and make a good guess, and perhaps give you a medication that works. But listening to your story to come up with a diagnosis, and then giving you a treatment based on the story is not really modern science. You know, if you're a cardiologist, your patient comes complaining of chest pain 
God, Doc, I got this chest pain. Oh, well, straight in, you're going to give you an angioplasty. Half the time, the chest pain is indigestion. And you're doing a surgical procedure on the heart based on the symptom? No, symptom should tell you what to test. The test should tell you how to treat. And the symptom, Doc, something's not right. Uh, well, let's test it. Oh, now the test will tell us what we can train or treat. And, you know, it, it, there, there's times that meds work together along with neurofeedback. And that's been shown to be quite effective. Uh, it, in epilepsy, we don't tell them to stop taking their anticonvulsants. We train them how to not need them. And then when they don't need them, they get pulled. But there was a very nice study on methylphenidate in ADD kids. And it was a school system. And they went in and tested the theta beta ratio at CZ. This is an old study, just a CZ theta beta. And uh, Vince Monastra was the uh, author on the study. And um, everybody that was a kid in the school that had a high theta beta ratio also was screened the behavioral uh, screening and they were diagnosed with ADD. So they were treated. All of them got methylphenidate. Randomly, they were picked for also getting neurofeedback. And the ones who got meds and neurofeedback did fine. The ones who did meds did fine. Six months later, they pulled the meds. All the medication only clients went back to their old ADD ways. The neurofeedback and meds remained okay. The, the neurofeedback had given them a skill set uh, that, that the meds alone never will. So uh, um, it, it, I think they, you know, I, uh, I, I'm not, proponent of meds, but I'm also uh, uh, dependent on them to keep me alive. So I'm not really anti-meds either. So um, the right ones it, at the right time, in the right place, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, there, there are schools that are about ready to throw a, a, a junior high school kid out. You know, if, if their behavior is not better by next week, they're gone. You know, well, I'm sorry, but neurofeedback is probably not going to be effective by next week. So, you know, having something that works short term that you then supplant the need for uh, may end up being a match that's required. You know, uh, 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 other circumstances, there's a couple that's having difficulty and they're about ready to split up. And the uh, ADD uh, adult in, ends up uh, uh, needing to be treated now. Um, and then treated for the long term, and and then pull the meds. So, uh, yeah, if the, I could loop back the to a, a population well. that I think Mindy and I both uh, work with, which which are the the, the children, um, and back uh, also to seizure disorder, um, and and the meds. You know, one of the things you know, if you you have a young a youngling, I like to say with uh, epilepsy, um, you know, some of the side effects of the meds can slow down the development right. of speech, slow down the development of motor skills, slow down growth spurts, et cetera, et cetera. So bringing a child, a very, very young child in for regular neuro at that point will change your world and the, the, the will not interfere with the developmental cycle. So, um, yeah, we, we talk yeah. a lot about older uh, folks, but, but uh, the young ones with, uh, with epilepsy, get your neuro, get your neuro. Preschool, beginning of school. Yeah, because you can create your own little learning disabilities and developmental disabilities uh, by very early intervention in meds. Now, who am I to say? First of all, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not an MD. <clears throat> and of course, the type of developmental damage you can do with con consistent and constant seizures, you have to balance that. But please give neuro a shot, you know. We're, all the yeah. stuff that we're talking about, team, and, and Mindy, chime in because you're, you're there on site. If a kid's not getting enough sleep, according to Jay and his studies, they're sleeping two hours less per night than, you know, in 1999, none of this stuff makes a, a difference or it's inefficient. Uh, do you, how do you get the kids to sleep more? 
let's let let's get this data straight here. Uh, in 1999, the theta beta ratio used to be 95 to 98 percent accurate predicting ADD. Now it's about 50 50 in its accuracy because kids sleep two hours less per night now than they did in 1999, and their theta has gone up and their beta has gone down because of the sleep deprivation. And at this point, you can't really truly differentiate. And there's very good publications on that, a meta-analysis of the, AD, of the, uh, uh, the theta-beta ratio across time, uh, showing that the effect size went from 1.8, which is really a good effect size. Effect size is the ability to separate two curves, uh, two distributions, one from the other. And now they're down at about 0.2 to 0.4, which is a 50-50 chance. So save yourself the trouble, flip a coin, you know, um, you get the same accuracy. So uh, theta beta ratio is still something to look at. Uh, you have to pay attention to the sleep pattern, fix the sleep pattern, uh, and neurofeedback does wonders with sleep. Uh, uh, beta at CZ is an insomnia driver, but you can also have another pattern that drives insomnia, and that's the anterior cingulate with the rumination. You lay down to go to sleep, and the old head gets locked on to whatever. Just won't shut the hell up. And, um, it, you know, that, that can keep you awake, too. So an obsessive-compulsive drive uh, can drive insomnia, just like CZ beta does. CZ beta has its own mechanism. Um, as you start to fall asleep, you drop, drop under the stage two. In stage two, you'll hear a sound. And that will give you a vertex wave that's right at CZ. Well, beta in the cortex, when you put an input into that cortex, gives you an exaggerated response. So the sound you hear will wake you up. If you don't have enough sleep spindle, it will definitely wake you up. So even with beta spindles, if you have a good SMR training and you have sleep spindles, you can counterbalance that beta spindle. And you can even train it down if it's a problem and, uh, and assist with sleep. And, uh, and once you get the sleep together, um, you've, you've benefited a tremendous amount. And uh, the residual ADD things um, are easily touched up at that point. But sleep is foundational. If you try to teach somebody who's not sleeping something and you try all day long to teach them something and they learn X number of things and they go to sleep and they don't get good sleep, no, not restorative sleep, slow wave sleep, they grow connections, REM sleep, they play back information through them, long-term potentiating them. So if, you're got, if you've got somebody who's not sleeping properly, they'll divide X by two. And the, the amount that they actually learn is, is impaired. Uh, they're they're not getting good you, consolidation at night. Yeah. How much do you think the, the sleep deprivation is an issue in the population you're working with? For me, um, I would say 100%, almost. Yeah. I think that every single client that I work with for neurofeedback starts with a sleep training because you can see in the data that they are not getting sufficient sleep. And I even just had a junior student in my office in tears this morning and she has ADHD, she has anxiety, she has depression, but the reason she is so unbalanced today is because she went to bed two hours later than usual last night and she was ruminating. She was ruminating about um, a speech that she has to give in a class today. And she yeah. just could not sleep. And I said, it's a vicious cycle because now you are going to be more emotional today. You're not going to be able to handle your stress and your situations because your brain has not fully rested and recovered from yesterday's stressful life. Yeah. yeah. And your estimate at 100% is what the clinician sees. You know, the people that are getting great sleep and they're doing well, they, they, they're not the ones that come through your door. Um, but we do see a skewed population. But the same is pretty much everybody that's not sleeping right is really common. It's not everybody, everybody, but it's so common. It sure feels like it. Uh, going through raw EEGs in large groups, people send them in and I go through the EEGs and in the eyes closed EEG, 
there's a point at five minutes and 300 seconds. If you haven't give, given us a vertex sharp wave before that, you don't have a sleep disorder. But if you have a vertex sharp wave before 300 seconds, you get to go to a sleep lab. And we pull more people out of the normal referral through straight for neurofeedback going to a sleep lab to find out what's going on with their sleep at night. Um, because if you can't treat them effectively until you get the sleep fixed. And if they have a sleep disorder, and insomnia is not a disorder, it, it's disordered sleep, but it's not a sleep disorder. You, know, you can't get tested for insomnia in a sleep lab. Um, they, they'll kick you out. They can't get paid for testing an insomniac. Um, uh, but if you have a sleep disorder, you'll fall asleep super fast. You know, vertex sharp wave is is the response to a sound. Uh, K complex is K for knock. So you give a rap on the side of the desk and you get this vertex wave with a nice spindle and they keep going to sleep. That's how it's supposed to work. If you make a rap on the desk and they get a vertex wave and they wake up, they don't have a good sleep spindle. And that, that's the kind of person who's got beta at CZ and they can't fall asleep because... You know, you're on your way to sleep. Every little sound pops you back awake. And during the night, you cycle back through. A little sound pops you back awake. So you have sleep onset and wakefulness insomnia from beta spindles at CZ. We actually published a paper on that in the research domain criteria when they they, they were saying the DSM is no good, so don't do a diagnosis study. Uh, just give us some biological measurement, a biomarker. And um, uh, we, we published in 2015 uh, beta spindles at CZ uh, corresponding with insomnia, independent of the DSM categories. Min, do you think that school hours are out of whack? I don't want to get you in trouble here, but uh, <laughs> why, <laughs> why do kids have to start school so early? Daycare? Well, I think because parents, so many parents have to get to work. And so they have to get their kids settled at school so they can go to work. And if I look at my high school students, they have so many obligations after school with yeah. sports and theater that in order to have the time and the hours committed to that, you have to start school earlier. Can I just jump in and piggyback what we were talking about last week? Bring sports music arts back into school they they tr so many you know the the three r's you know which we can't even spell <laughs> uh, but you know the the training on the brain and the development of the person is so huge and uh if you're not doing all those things after school you have time for rest you have time for play parents aren't going mad running and driving kids everywhere and kids are not eating dinner at 9 30 trying to finish their homework up to 11 and losing those two hours of sleep after of course they check their social media and text for another hour so there, there's my rant Do you support my, <laughs> in my language there we go there we go. Yeah, these, I should, I should have pom poms when she gets going on a rant. You know, <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> no, no, the schools are are not saving uh, money by taking out uh, sports, arts, and and music. I mean, music yeah. is an art, but I just want to put it in because sometimes people confuse uh, fine arts or drawing and painting, et cetera, with theater and with music. Um, but the amount I really, really believe the amount of special education and special um, treatments and meds, et cetera, would go far down if you had balanced uh, cultural um, knowledge acquisition yeah. and cultural training, um, not just the pure scholastics, uh, which, by the way, is, is it comes in too young. But, uh, that's do they, do they have health class at the... the the most reliable thing that happens if you stop a music program is that the math scores deteriorate yeah. you know so uh, they're you know kids aren't little categories you know they're they're beings and you have to foster the the they're the, the, as a full being not you know and you know music is a big part of life i mean goodness music is math by osmosis if you take a, a, a child, a little, little child, and start trying to teach them the math, one plus one equals, or four plus four equals, and instead teach them music, 
sort of, I'd say teach very loosely, expose them to music where they learn that, you know, four by four and two by two, all of that just by osmosis in the rhythms. Okay, yeah. I'm on a rant. I'll shut up. Here, I'm going to put water <laughs> on your rant. Uh, get it's back the to red the, hair. What can I say? <laughs> get, get back to the schools. Mindy, do they, do they teach health, uh, some type of health class at the school? And, and, and if so, do they teach, you know, about the brain and that there is control, <laughs> maybe HRV breathing at least? So these kids that have anxiety, at least they can have a feeling of, hey, you know what? I can control my breathing and chill. Is any anything like that going on that you've seen? You know, in the state of Minnesota, students have to take one semester worth of health class. And so our high school students, they have it for one semester. Um, I don't think a lot is spent on brain development. It's more making healthy choices, um, nutrition, reproductive unit. Some students will take a psychology class as a junior or senior. And in there, we do go more in depth with brain. But no, I think that if students could understand how to take deep breaths, they could regulate their anxiety. I mean, so many kids are coming in my office and they're so anxious about something. And when we just breathing, you know, it's like you get nervous, your brain starts getting flooded with emotions, your heart rate increases, then you breathe shallow because you're trying to keep up with your heart. Well, if you can just slow down your breathing, you can then calm down the heart, then calm down the brain, relieve the anxiety. And so that's really what students need to learn how to do and spend more time outside. Taking yes. away recess once they get to middle school is also a challenge. Yeah. 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 Is there the anything punishment there... you can give a kid is to take away recess when they're behaviorally <laughs> acting up. It yeah. makes it all worse. Yeah. Is there anything yeah. to gender specific teaching like uh Adolescent boys learn better from males. Uh, Netflix is doing a lot of uh, mental health shows that, you know, that's where I get my PhD from. Uh, I just wonder <laughs> if, if any of that is, is going on. Because I'm kind of remembering, you know, I think guys have more patience and they understand that the, the boys need to run off some of the steam. That's where you're getting to the recess. I'm just wondering if any of that comes into play to put uh, more – more males in the teacher position. And I know that's not a politically correct thing that we want to say, but. We're not right? politically correct here. We're not <laughs> stupid either. Yeah. It's interesting because I think a lot of it comes from what their family system is like. And if they have a good relationship with a mom or a dad, or um, if there's trauma in relation to one gender over another, I know that even from a therapeutic standpoint, I have had a handful of girls that have gone through so many different young female therapists and they're not resonating with that therapist. They feel no connection. And I, and a lot of times I recommend they try a man because what I have found as when in 2002, when I was first in grad school to become a therapist, I went through nine therapists, because we had to see what it was like on the other side of the table as a client. Um, I went through nine young women. And the reason I didn't enjoy my time with them is I didn't want them to keep telling me, I know what it feels like to be in your shoes. I went through something similar where when I saw a man, he would look at me and say, I don't know what that feels like. And at that point in my life, that's what I needed. I needed to be the expert in how I felt and not have somebody tell me what they felt in a very similar situation. So I think it's very individualized, you know, what kind of personality a student gets along with. If a teacher, a male teacher has them getting up and moving around more. Um, I do have some students that they do better with women who are very routine based, very organized students know what is expected every single day. Um, and if they go into a classroom that is a little more chaotic or unexpected, that's when the anxiety comes. So It'd be a good thing to research and it'd be fascinating, but I think it's all individualized. I'll jump in here. I mean, one of the, you know, I'm very critical sometimes of the the, the therapy or the training that um, young therapists get in terms of <clears throat> holding too much space and being over empathetic. Okay. Yep. 
you can find somebody to hold your hand or you should be able to find somebody to hold your hand. But if you want to actually get out of the place where you're in, you need some action, uh, whether it's your therapist that pushes you or, as you said, uh, the th you, you own your own show regardless. But also going back to uh, gender. Um, earlier work, and I don't, I don't mind disclosing my age, I'm in my late 50s, and I'm of the generation where it, it was just black and white when females were taught math, science, chemistry, etc. from a female, they excelled. When females were taught those subjects by a male, they didn't. So that was the inherent sexism um, expectation wise. Also seeing the potential, seeing yourself or potential of yourself reflected in the teacher. So I think a major issue actually in past was that primary school teachers were female um, and young males did not do well in that environment and secondary school teachers were um, male and females did not do that well. I think it's very, very healthy just as in the rest of, of life to have male and female primary school teachers, male and female secondary school teachers. We're, we're, we're losing the balance for so many, so many reasons. Um, and the best blessing any child or adolescent can find is just that it doesn't have to be all teachers, just that one teacher that sees your spark um, and that student that sees that one teacher that says, yeah, I respect you. I want to be like you. Um, and then they walk in the light. Yeah. One last curveball. Ha! Alpha theta trading. Think we should do that before the kids start school so they get into the frame of mind to consume information? Hmm. Alpha theta training is usually used for going deep internally <clears throat> and in becoming in contact with your um, pre-conscious, unconscious material. And that's not necessarily something uh, to avoid in a therapeutic circumstance but if you're prepping yourself for the day in school trying to go deeper into the kind of sleep onset state isn't going to prime you for being on uh to focus and uh, all of that um so I, it doesn't sound like a good start for the day unless you need to do a meditative start for the day um, and, and you have time set aside for that. So um, peak performance, it, not a good idea before taking uh, it? Peak performance is different for everybody. You know, um, uh, uh, there, there are 11 separate phenotypic patterns that you've got in the EEG, and every one of them requires a different intervention. And... Uh, they all can be optimized. There's always a way to play your cards when you're dealt, but um, it, you know that that it's it's not one size fits all. I mean, goodness, uh, Pete, you know one size doesn't fit all. Uh, <laughs> if, if I ran the school system, I would actually put. I I think. Um, Many people know I'm not a huge fan of uh, some of the mindfulness meditation for certain folks in the population, as Jay was mentioning, you know, with phenotypes. But I would say each morning before school, give the kids an option. You can run around in the in the schoolyard in the or in the gym for 15 minutes, or you can sit down and compose and do a mindfulness exercise and have the children choose i think the sooner we get to know whether we are an individual who needs quiet to quiet or whether we need arousal uh, uh to quiet um yeah. <clears throat> gosh 15 minutes in the morning i think it could yeah. change so much mindy what do you feel about that yeah i agree i think um finding things that bring them enjoyment you know because so many students when they come to school they don't want to do eight hours of school but if they can do something pleasurable right before starting their work, their brain is ready for the day. I yeah. also think that in the afternoon, giving them something also, giving them a break halfway through. I have some middle school boys that it is night and day difference. The days that they can go shoot basketball 
in the gym right after they eat before going to the end of their classes. They are more attentive. They've gotten their energy out. They've physically moved their bodies. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, I totally agree. Do something that brings you pleasure before you have to go about a draining day doing something you don't like. Mindy, wh where do we send people to find out more uh, about your services in Minnesota? Yeah, they can go um, to my website at www.aftontherapy.com. They can also find me on Facebook and Instagram at Afton Therapy. And, you know, like I said, a lot of my neurofeedback is all done remotely. Um, so they can come in. I can show them how to do the assessments, even if they're out of Minnesota. But, um, yeah, I would love to help as many people as possible. Maybe John Anderson will stop by. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so did did you grow up in Minnesota? I did. Yes, I grew up in the Twin Cities. And then I, you know, students here think I'm addicted to school and learning, which I, I might be. But I went to the University of Kentucky for my undergrad degree. And then I went to Xavier in Cincinnati for my master's degree in school counseling. And then I have my Minnesota State University for I'm a licensed school principal, so educational specialist. And then I got my marriage and family therapy license through Adler Graduate School of Psychology. And then I'm also brain certified in Dr. Amen Clinics and certified internationally through BCIA. So a lot of things. That's a nice. Well, nice. I was trying to figure out why you don't have the classic Minnesota accent. I grew up in Fargo and oh. uh, I, my, I, my summers were always at the lakes in Minnesota. So uh, when I hear a classic Minnesota accent, I feel like I've suddenly arrived at home. Somehow. Right. So right. Uh, I was halfway expecting uh, the Minnesota accent, but your, I think your years of schooling elsewhere may have uh, <laughs> taken the edge off of your, your, your the, the Minnesota lilt, you know, Yes. Um, anyway, uh, um, uh, you sound fine. Don't, uh, yeah. don't get <laughs> yeah. it wrong. You know, so. well, isn't you it funny, funny too? Because when I first moved back to Minnesota from Kentucky, I had a Southern twang. And if I get on a phone call with any friends in Kentucky, it comes back. And so it is just bizarre how, where you are, you just kind of pick up the slang and the language. If I'm back with my four younger sisters, pretty soon it's, yeah, yeah, you know. Don't you know? Yeah, yeah. don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> See, Dr. Marie, it's all yeah, about sure. Charlotte. Yeah, sure, you betcha. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, it doesn't take long. It all comes back like a bad dream, you know. So. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on the show. Thank yes, you, thank you so much for having me. Jay Gunkelman, Dr. Marie Swingle. And of course, Mindy Hockendahl, Hot Noen Hockendahl, Noen, Noen, in yes. Minnesota. Yes. Thank you for reaching out and coming on the show. What a blast! Of course. Thank you so much. Take care, all. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye. The NeuroNoodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you.